What do you think could be the very strong connections between this rainbow and this piano? It may seem absurd, but in terms of history, mathematical concepts and physics, they are actually remarkably well connected. Let's see why. Let's start with the rainbow. After leaving the sun, white light travels at a speed of just under 300,000 km per second for about 8 minutes before arriving at the Earth. At that speed, it could travel around the Earth 7.5 times every second. So the distance between the sun and the Earth in this model would have to be 100 times larger in order to be to scale. If there are water droplets in the Earth's atmosphere under the correct circumstances, this light disperses into separate components of different wavelengths, which we see as different colors. Red light has the longest wavelength, forming a more stretched out wave, while violet light has the shortest wavelength, forming a more compressed wave. For centuries, a theory was put forward that viewed white light as pure or perfect and stated that the light gets contaminated in some way by the dispersive material, namely the water droplets or a glass prism in experiments. It was thought that these impurities caused the different colors. However, Sir Isaac Newton performed a clever experiment in which he let the dispersed light shine through an identical prism which was inverted, so that the dispersion was reversed. This caused the colored light to be recombined into a resultant white light, which indicated that the colors were not caused by some kind of contamination, but were indeed components of the white light. Today, we know that these colors, or these wavelengths, form what we call the visible light spectrum, but that they are actually a very small part of a much wider group of radiation called the electromagnetic spectrum. We can only see a very small part of this spectrum, but we have constructed instruments that are able to detect and even produce electromagnetic radiation across the spectrum. While some of these waves, especially at the high energy end of the spectrum, have caused much harm before and even after being understood, we've managed to harness the breadth of the spectrum for all kinds of useful applications. But for now, we are interested in visible light only, with wavelengths from around 380 to 750 nanometers. As an example, blue-green light with a wavelength of 500 nanometers means that one billion of these wavelengths next to each other would be 500 meters long. You may have noticed that colors like pink and proper purple that isn't closer to a dark blue does not appear on the spectrum. This is because these colors can only be achieved by combining more than one color from the spectrum. But let's get to our final point regarding the rainbow and its colors. Note that this spectrum is continuous with gradual changes rather than abrupt jumps between colors. Yet, most of us would remember having to memorize the so-called seven, or more recently six, distinct colors of the rainbow. There are, of course, good reasons for simplifying a continuous concept into a few discrete groups. For example, it makes illustrating it a lot easier, especially in centuries gone by. Secondly, it makes it easier to teach the colors to children without the need for them having been introduced to some of the more challenging concepts already. The well-known seven colors of the rainbow were originally selected by Newton. Like most civilizations throughout history, Newton placed a lot of value on certain number systems, be they real, imaginary or symbolic, and he desperately wanted the rainbow to be grouped into seven discrete colors. It is quite probable that some factors behind this desire aligned with the fact that Pythagoras had divided the octave in music into seven parts hundreds of years earlier. And this is why indigo was included. Thinking about it logically, and in terms of the physics, it makes sense to have only six discrete colors. Red, yellow and blue are the primary colors. Human eyes contain three different types of photoreceptors, one for each of the primary colors, that register only that color. All other colors are mixes of these three primary colors. A system with one secondary color for every combination of primary colors is a lot more sensible. This means adding orange as a mix between red and yellow, green as a mix between yellow and blue, and violet as a mix between blue and red. Indigo is truly the odd one out, and it is being omitted from the discrete rainbow colors more and more. Finally, note that there are some animals that can actually see parts of the electromagnetic spectrum that we humans cannot. That's all we're touching on in terms of light for this video. 
We'll now discuss sound and point out the similarities between the discrete rainbow representing light and the piano representing sound. Just like light, sound is composed of waves of different wavelengths or frequencies. The human ear can hear sounds with frequencies from around 20 Hz to about 20,000 Hz, with especially the higher limit dropping off with age to about 14,000 Hz around the time your midlife crisis hits. The audible sound spectrum corresponds to the visible light spectrum in that it's a sub-range that we can hear that forms a part of a wider spectrum of sound frequencies. Let's listen to a few of these frequencies. In sound, the concept of white noise mirrors the concept of white light in optics. Similar to white light being composed of all the different colored light, white noise is composed of all the differently pitched sounds playing at once. Our ears can detect these different frequencies by means of the changes in pressure they cause in our vestibular systems through vibrations, causing us to hear differently pitched sounds. When combining only our example frequencies, the combination sounds like this. But a more accurate sound for the entire spectrum would be... While it can be quite hard to intuitively grasp just how fast light waves move and vibrate, sound waves move and vibrate at much lower speeds and frequencies. And we can actually visualize it fairly easily. Consider the 40 Hz wave, which means it forms 40 completed waves per second. Note that we have only illustrated 4 waves, so this distance corresponds to a tenth of a second. Since sound struggles along at almost a snail's pace of around 340 meters per second in normal air, the 4 wavelengths illustrated here would be about 34 meters long in real life. Let's think about that wave hitting your ear for a moment. Sound waves don't actually carry the medium they propagate through with them from start to finish. But you could try and visualize it in this way. Imagine you have a 350 meter long length of rope with a knot tied in at every 17 meters. That gives you 20 knots over the length of the rope corresponding to 20 hertz with 10 meters spare sticking out behind you. You're holding the rope loosely at one end with both hands which represent your ear. Now, a group of very strong people latch onto that 10 meter short end of the rope sticking out behind you and pulls so hard that the entire length of rope in front of you is pulled through your hands in a single second. You are actually able to sense each knot as it passes through and correctly count 20 knots in that one second. If you think that's impressive, it gets better. A young healthy person can actually correctly count up to 20,000 knots in that same length of rope in one second. Only at more than 20,000 knots do the tempo of knots passing through become too large to handle, corresponding to not being able to hear the frequency anymore. On the other side of the spectrum, as soon as fewer than 20 knots pass through per second, things are actually happening so slowly that you start to forget when the last knot went through and what the count was again corresponding to not being able to hear the frequency anymore. That is how fast our ears and brains process sound waves. And there are some animals that can sense and produce infrasound with frequencies lower than 20 Hz or ultrasound with frequencies higher than 20 kHz. Let's have a quick look at dispersion of sound waves before we get to that piano. When you hit a short metal bar at one end and listen to the sound at the other end, you hear quite a short blunt sound like this. However, if you increase the length of metal that the sound waves travel through, for example by using a coiled spring, the different frequencies get separated enough to give you these interesting sounds at the other end of the coiled spring. The higher frequencies reach the other end first. This is actually how they produced the laser weapon sounds for the original 1977 Star Wars movie. Now, what about that piano? In many civilizations throughout history, people have realized that halving the length of a string at some tension 
leads to a note that sounds very pleasing when combined with a note of the original string. Here's an example. This is what we know as an octave today, and we can continue halving the strings to get higher and higher octaves like this. These notes sound good together because their waves are synchronized. One wavelength of the lower C equals two wavelengths of the middle C equals four wavelengths of the higher C. This corresponds to a mathematical function 2 to the power of x, since the strings double in length as you move from right to left. This 2 to 1 ratio is the most important one in music, leading to octaves. But you also need some notes in between the octave notes. How do you go about selecting the discrete points on this continuous function to represent the continuous frequencies? Pythagoras was obsessed with ratios and he reasoned that the next most important and simplest ratio after 2 to 1 was 3 to 2. So he devised a method of finding notes in between that would also synchronize. Instead of cutting off half of the string each time, you only cut off half of that half or a quarter. Alternatively, you take a string that is 50% longer than your starting string by adding half of that string to it. So we start with a higher C and add half its length. Then we shift the string to its place on the continuous function. We will see later that this note corresponds to F. We repeat this, but now we see that our new note A sharp has gone past the next C, so it has escaped our octave. To bring it back in line, we do what we've already done to the C notes. We halve it to bring it back one octave. We then continue with this new note, adding half of the length each time and halving the string when it crosses into the next octave to haul it back. Keep an eye out for the distances between the notes, and you will see that the gaps are starting to fill up. When we get to 12 notes or half steps in the octave, we have a set of decently spaced notes, which correspond to the 12 half steps in an octave of the piano, when including both the ebony and ivory keys. You could actually continue with this process, and when you get to 53 notes per octave, you will have another evenly spaced set of 53 notes per octave. But that would be somewhat impractical. Discrete instruments would have to be built with 53 notes per octave, and just think how much more complicated sheet music would be. This selection of notes, while having its drawbacks, was good enough to be used for hundreds of years. But music eventually got more melodically adventurous, and things like increased key changes started highlighting that some notes in more complex arrangements were just not close enough approximations, even if most of the inaccuracies were scarcely noticeable by even well-trained ears. This increase in complexity, together with independent developments in non-Western countries, and the important discovery that waves can be expressed as sine functions, has led to a host of slightly to radically different tuning systems. But most people won't be able to recognize the difference between this Pythagorean C major scale and this more modern equal tempered tuning. And there you have it. Light waves and sound waves share some very important characteristics, like dispersion. In the same way that our seven or six color discrete rainbows are simplifications of the more complete continuous visible light spectrum, we have also developed various discrete simplifications of the continuous audible sound spectrum. I hope you found this video insightful. Let me know in the comments what surprised you the most. And remember to like and subscribe if you'd like to see more.